uh, Wim Godden has been working with uh, open source technology since 1997, which I think makes me about five or six years old. Um, <laughs> makes me feel very young. Um, and has been open, uh, involved in many open source technologies such as PHP compatibility and OpenX. Uh, next to web development, he's worked in a wide range of technologies from database clusters to uh, internet backbone design and uh, focuses a lot of his time on uh, high scalability projects and uh, coaching and training uh, web engineers. So uh, from React PHP through to Facebook's Hack Async implementation, uh, many more. Um, asynchronous uh, programming has been a pretty hot topic in the last couple of years. Uh, but how well does async programming uh, actually work in PHP and what can you actually use it for in your projects? Uh, we'll look through some real-world uh, use cases and how they leverage the power of async to do things you didn't know PHP could do. So, Wim Godden with the promise of asynchronous PHP. Good morning. So, last talk before lunch. Everybody looking forward to that, I guess. Um, so, we're going to talk a bit as... Uh, uh, in the introduction said, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about asynchronous PHP. Uh, let me quickly tell you a little bit more about myself, stuff that hasn't been said yet. So uh, I'm from Belgium, uh, the, lot, the little dark green spot in the center of Europe, best known for, well, right now best known for terror attacks and stuff like that, but um, probably best known for things like Belgian beer or Belgian chocolate or other... <laughs> Other tasty, yummy things, um, or odd-looking buildings. This is an iron crystal magnified 65 billion times. Yes, you can walk inside of it, and it apparently has the highest toilet in Belgium. Um, I'm from a town very close to Antwerp, where we have a beautiful abbey, a couple of castles, stuff like that. It's all very nice. Uh, huge issue, though, in Belgium is stuff like traffic. This is what happens when we have snow then you get 2,500 kilometers of traffic in a country that's 250 kilometers across. So smack in the middle of that, I uh, started a company 15 years ago. It's called Cube Solutions. We do mostly PHP, but also quite a bit of other stuff outside of that. Um, and I've been doing open source for the last uh, 19 years or so, uh, working on a couple of open source projects. And I've been doing talks like these for the last couple of years. OK, that's enough about me. Let's see who you are, who here is a developer. Yes, most of us. Who's ever worked with asynchronous PHP before? Well, quite a few people, more and more every, every time I give a talk, good. Ever, anyone ever worked with Node.js? Okay, quite a few people. Okay, so uh, to understand what asynchronous versus synchronous processing is, let's have a look first at what synchronous processing is. So let's imagine we have a web shop, and at some point, somebody orders and makes a payment. Then we're going to insert that order into the database. We're going to check if the payment actually was done, if that person didn't try to fake it somehow, get around it. Um, and once we check the payment, we're going to update the stock information. And then we're going to make a call to Federal Express to have it shipped. And then we're going to send a mail. And then we're going to send that person to the thank you page. Now, this entire process could take like five seconds, maybe 10 seconds. We don't want our user to wait that long. So it would be kind of nice if we could do some of these things simultaneously. So ideally, we would want to do something like this. We still have to insert the order and check the payment for first, but then we might be able to update the stock information and at the same time already make a call to the FedEx API and send out the mail thanking the user for ordering and so we save a bit of time because we don't have to do everything sequentially here. Now, the problem occurs, of course, when you have to do multiple things at the same time. Um, in the early days of PHP, that was sort of a problem, but actually it's been possible for quite a few years now to do that. Um, whenever you have something that makes a call to external stuff, and external stuff is not just making a call to the web, um, it could be just writing and reading to disk, um, or it could be stuff on the network, it could be communicating with the database, uh, or it could be sending mail. Anything that talks to stuff outside of your code, um, you get what we know as block, blocking I.O. So we're waiting for stuff to be read or stuff to be written. Uh, that's not a good thing. 
obviously, because we have to wait. And waiting means our user, well, we cannot process code, so our user is waiting for stuff to happen. So we prefer to have stuff, stuff that's non-blocking, which means we can work on multiple things at the same time, and we sort of get rid of the sequential part, although, of course, we're still executing lines of code one after the other. But we can execute multiple blocks at the same time. Now, you might wonder, how the heck do you know in that case if you're processing multiple things at the same time, how do you know when one of them is finished? Well, obviously we have events for that. Um, now, there's a couple of standard events. There's a start event. You could have a progress update, maybe. And then there's the end of the event, which is either success or failure. Anyone know this kind of structure? Yeah, I see a couple of hands going up very quickly. Um, yeah, this is callback hell. Uh, this is what people who use Node.js um, will definitely recognize, especially the early days. Um, this is what we want to avoid. And so I'm not going to go and show you stuff like that. I'm going to try to avoid that. So let's have a look at what asynchronous PHP uh, looks like today. Um, there are actually several built-in functions uh, into PHP, native PHP, even without installing any extensions, without installing any Peckle stuff. Um, and then there are several libraries that you can install that use the built-in functions. There's also Facebook Hack, which has built-in support for asynchronous uh, processing. I'm not going to go that far. I'm, I'm not going to discuss that. Um, we would need someone with way better experience with, uh, with Facebook Hack to, to talk about that. So let's have a look at some of the built-in functions and some of the extensions that you can install in PHP to make it possible to do asynchronous stuff. So the first one is pthreads, which, is, um, which allows you to do multi-threading within uh, PHP. However, it does require you to install uh, the thread-safe um, version of PHP. Uh, the way it works, let's have a look at some code. Oh, OK. So what you have to do is basically extend the thread class, which is available once you install pthreads. Um, and so in this case, we have a web request class. We have uh, uh, two methods, uh, two properties in there called URL and response. And then we're going to set that URL using a constructor. And once we run the run method, we're going to do just file get contents. Now, file get contents normally is a blocking operation. If you were to run file get contents in your code, it would actually block any execution of any other code until that file get contents is finished. Um, however, when we, do, when we use pthreads, what we can do is say, OK, we're going to create a new web request. We're going to request our, our website. And then we can say request start. Now, at this very moment, it's going to run that run method, which is going to do the file get contents. Normally, you would have to wait until that file get contents has been completed. But in this case, it will immediately do whatever comes next. Um, in our case, we're going to create an array with 10 million records saying test, and we're going to loop over them, which is kind of silly, I know, but it, we just have to do something. Um, and then at the end of that, we're going to say request join. Now, on the request join line, what happens is is going to check if the file get contents has actually been completed. If it has, then we just continue. If the file get contents is still running, then we will wait for it. So we are actually blocking right there. But in this case, we can basically run two things at the same time. We can do the file get contents, and we can do that array fill and the loop at the same time. And then we can, of course, at the end, echo the, re the response here. So that's B threads. Another one that you could use is PCNTL fork, uh, which basically forks the PHP process. Uh, it doesn't use multi-threading. It uses, creates a new process. Um, it doesn't allow you to communicate between different processes, and it does not behave very well on Apache, so I would not really advise you to use this kind of thing anyway. There's also a thing called popen, um, which does a very well, let's, let's look at the example here. So we have a child in which we can do whatever we want, do some work, in this case, just an echo. Uh, and you can actually say p open, and then you will actually run php child.php. Uh, the nice thing is you can get back any contents from that using the stream get contents. 
The problem is, this doesn't seem to behave very well, I mean, it doesn't behave exactly the same way on every single operating system. So if you want to run, if you want to create code that behaves the same way on your Windows and your Linux and your Mac OS and so on, don't use popen in any case. So what a lot of people do is the reason they want the ability to do uh, asynchronous processing is request multiple URLs, like request data from Google and Yahoo and many other sites at the same time. Um, and normally what you would do in that case is something like this. You would get all those URLs, you would initialize a curl instance with curl in it, you would set the URL, you would say I want the return back, and then you would run those. However, that would not be very quick. Well, let's see. So I have here curl single, which is basically the code that we just saw here. And if we run that, it's gonna take a little time and my Wi-Fi is working. So it's gonna take 6.8 seconds, which is a long time to wait. However, we could rewrite that using a built-in functionality in PHP using curl multi. The code looks a little bit more complicated because we have to initialize curl multi um, and then we have to initialize every single curl handle, handler and then basically we say at some point curl multi exec and it's gonna run all those requests. The big advantage of it is that it's slightly faster. Curl multi and so instead of 6.8 seconds it now runs in two and a half seconds because basically we're doing those requests simultaneously. So this is kind of neat. Um, of course, there is another way of doing this as well. Let's imagine that you have a big chunk of code, um, a big chunk of code that takes 400 milliseconds to complete, and basically within that code, there's a section that takes 100 milliseconds, another one that takes 100, and a third one that takes 100. And then the additional 100 is sort of overlapping between those three. So one way to, to make this asynchronous is to say, okay, I'm going to keep my logic that binds all the things together in the main.php, and I'm gonna put the other things in three separate files. And then instead of including those, I'm actually gonna call those using curl and set the timeout to one millisecond, say exec and close. So basically you're just making three web requests. Please don't do this. Um, there's a couple of reasons. The reason I, I illustrate is because I've seen a customer do this. And this works, but you don't get any feedback. You don't actually know if those sub calls are successful. You don't get any response back. So it might work, it might not work, you have no clue actually. So this is not really the right way to use curl as an asynchronous processing system. So if we look at PHP and the different um, libraries that it can provide, uh, there's a couple of event handling libraries that it can use. Most of these are PHP extensions. Uh, most of them are available through Peckel. Um, there's libevent, which is best known um, because it's being used by things like memcached. There's also libev, which you cannot use on uh, Windows, and there's also libuv, which is sort of the, I think the newest one, the, the, the most modern one. Um, however, you don't need any of those to do asynchronous processing in PHP. You can use standard stream select, which has been around for quite a while. Now, I wanna illustrate uh, asynchronous processing with one specific library, and I think it's the best known one, which is why I'm using this one. It's called React PHP. Has anyone ever used React PHP? A couple of people, okay. Um, basically, it's an event-driven, non-blocking I.O. library. Non-blocking because it allows you to do asynchronous PHP. Um, it's event-driven, which is also kind of nice because we can handle those events. If something changes, if a status changes and so on, we can hook into that. And it's written completely in PHP. So it does not require you to install any additional extensions. It, if you just install a core PHP installation without additional extensions, it will work. It can use some of the other libraries as well, 
um, and it will have some advantages then, but it can run without them as well. And it implements what we call an event loop. And the event loop is sort of the basic system of the asynchronous processing engine of, of React PHP. So the event loop is based on what we call uh, ticks, um, not the animals that you want to avoid, just a standard one tick is one loop iteration through the event loop. Um, it also provides timers, uh, two different ones, a one-time timer and a periodic timer that runs every number of seconds. Um, and every single time you have input and output uh, communication in React PHP, you can hook on a callback system. So that way you can attach events to it. I'm gonna illustrate it with a couple of examples. These are sort of the, the very simple, basic examples that you'll find everywhere. Um, so let's imagine that we wanna create a web server in React PHP, which is, might sound kind of silly. Why would you run a web server in PHP? But it's just a simple example. Sorry? Because you can, exactly. <laughs> um, so, as I said, the event loop is sort of the basics of everything. So, the first thing you have to do with React PHP is initialize that event loop. So, to do that, React event loop, factory, create. Now we have our event loop. It's not running yet. It's not doing anything yet, but we have it. Then we can create a, a socket to listen to some port, for example. Uh, and we need to attach that to the event loop so that if anything happens on that socket, it will trigger an event. We tell it to listen to port 80 because usually that's where a web server listens to. And then we can say, okay, I wanna attach an HTTP server. Now React PHP has a lot of functionality built in and there's a lot of uh, additional uh, code that you can find on GitHub that extends onto uh, the, the basic React PHP project. An HTTP server, a standard, simple HTTP server is part of that. Of course, you need to attach it to that socket, which is listening to port 80, and you need to attach it to the loop so that if an HTTP request comes in, it's handled by React PHP, by the event loop. And then we can just say, okay, if we get a request, so on request, run a piece of code. In this case, what we're just gonna do is very simple. We're gonna return an HTTP header 200 OK, and we're gonna say, hello world. Does this work? Nope, it doesn't, because we still have to start the event loop. If you forget loop run, your code is just gonna end and it's not gonna do anything. As soon as you do loop run, it's gonna start listening on that socket and it's gonna wait for a connection. So that's an entire web server in PHP. Well, it's not gonna do much, it's just gonna say hello world, but it'll do that. You can extend on that. So, basic structure is you have your event loop using stream select or lib event or libev or event and so on. You have a uh, stream on top of that, you have a socket listening on top of that, and you have your HTTP server. Now, in this case, I used an HTTP server, but it could be an IRC server or a WebSocket library or a DNS server even. There is a DNS server on top of React PHP. I don't know why you would run it. Yes, probably because you can, but um, it, it's all available and you can extend as much as you want on that. So we talked about timers. I said it's possible to have a timer, so you can have a one-time timer. In this case, I add to the event loop a timer that will run in 15 seconds and do nothing more than just throw an exception saying we have a timeout. Could be useful in some cases. Now, of course, you want to be able to prevent this from occurring, so you can also cancel the timer, of course. Um, so that's a one-time timer. Uh, but you can have periodic timers. So to have a periodic timer running every 30 seconds, for example, doing uh, a check whether a certain host is alive. And then if it's not alive, you cancel the timer, throw an exception, otherwise it will just continue running. So it will check every 30 seconds, it will run this code automatically. And it will do that while other stuff is going on, if you want. So you could have, for example, uh, have a host live uh, check on 15 different servers at the same time. 
React PHP uses um, a concept of promise, also known in certain languages as uh, futures. If you know, use Node.js, you probably know the concept very well. Um, basically, the way the system works is you have a piece of code that you know in advance is going to have to, it's going to execute something and it's going to return um, either a success or failure or a status update. Um, and based on that result, you want to perform some action. And you want that code to be executed in an asynchronous way. Um, so in that case, what you can say is, and we'll look at a, a more concrete example in a second, um, you can say, okay, I have a promise here. Um, whenever this code runs, I want you to act on the response of that. And there's two parameters, two uh, parameters to the then function here. The first one is when it is successful, run this piece of code. Uh, the second one is when it's not successful or rejected, as we say, um, run this piece of code. And then the third one is for progress changes, status updates, things like that. Let's look at a, um, a very simple example because you can also chain this kind of stuff. So for example, let's say we have a piece of code that runs and whenever we get a success or a status change or rejection back, then we can run a piece of code that follows it. So for example, if, if the result would be successful and I would get a parameter of one, it would return one here, which would multiply by two, and that result is returned to this function, which means we get four now, and so we get an output of C is now four. You can do this, so this is when it's successful, because we always use the first parameter of the then function, but you can chain them as well with failures. So, very simple example here, if we use a parameter of 10, it's gonna say A is greater than five, return 20 in that case, and it's just gonna echo 20. However, if, I'm, if I give it a parameter of one, A is gonna be less than five, it's gonna throw an exception, which is gonna end up in the second parameter here of the then function, because an exception is a failure, and so it's gonna echo out, we get this exception too small. Okay, let's look at an actual example, because this is very theoretical. So let's imagine that we are a hosting provider or something. Anyone here work for a hosting company? Yeah, a couple of people, okay. So let's imagine that we have a box there where you can fill out a couple of host names, comma separated. And those host names will be added to the system somehow, but we wanna be sure that those host names actually exist. So we wanna do a DNS lookup. If you did that in the old fashioned synchronous way, you would do something like this. You would explode on the comma, and then you would maybe try to filter out some odd host names, and then you would loop over each of those host names and do get host by name, um, trying to get the IP address. Now you might wonder, what's, the, what's that next line? Does anyone know what get host by name returns if it's unsuccessful? It's, sorry? the original input. It's one of those PHP oddities. So you look for some host name that doesn't exist, what you get back is the host name that doesn't exist. Otherwise you get the IP back. So it's kind of weird. So in this case, we have to loop over that. Now the problem here is, if you put in 10 host names, you're gonna do 10 sequential DNS lookups. If you put a thousand in here, that's gonna take quite a while. Um, Plus, if you get t DNS timeouts, it introduces even more delays. So it would be kind of nice to have multiple DNS lookups at the same time. The only way to do that is to do them asynchronously. So let's see if we can do that with React. Um, so we create the event loop, of course, and React also has a DNS resolver. So we create that one, we attach it to the loop, assign it, a DNS server to use, in this case, the Google DNS server. And then we do the same thing as before. We say, okay, you know what? Um, I'm gonna explode on the comma, filter out some dangerous host names, and I'm gonna create an array of promises. And this is where it gets fun. So, we're gonna loop over those host names, but instead of doing the DNS lookup right away, we're gonna say, okay, use that factory here, the DNS resolver, and resolve that host name. 
And if it's successful, return the host name and the IP address. Otherwise, return nothing. It's blank. This code will not run yet. Nothing's happening yet because we didn't start the event loop. Now, of course, we need to get the output of it somehow. And there is a way to say, OK, when everything has been completed, when all the DNS lookups have been completed, then start processing the output of it. And the way to do that is by saying react promise. If all these promises have been completed, then process the output. This is going to be an array of output returned here. Um, and then you can do stuff with whatever is being returned. And then you say event loop run. This will run maybe a thousand lookups at the same time, uh, which could be kind of dangerous because you don't want to overload your DNS server. So you, you might want to sort of limit how many you run simultaneously. But still, it's going to run a lot faster than doing one DNS lookup and then the next and then the next. So that was the concept of promises, which is very useful. Um, but it is a little bit limited because you can only get stuff back. You can't actually communicate back and forth. Um, there's also the concept of streams, which is a lot more powerful and a little bit more complicated, but not all that much. Streams can be either readable, writable, or both. Um, for example, a through stream or a filter is both readable and writable because you're sending something in and something comes out of it as well. You can create whatever you want in terms of streams and filters and stuff like that. A very simple example is you create the event loop. I keep repeating that. Um, let's say you want to read a file. You can just say, OK, I'm going to react stream a file with f open. I'm going to run it through a filter that I wrote, an alphanumeric filter. And then my destination is going to be another file. Great. So we set up our source, our filter, and our destination. If we want to make this work now in an asynchronous way, all we have to do is say, take the source, pipe it through the filter, pipe it to the destination. For those of you who are very familiar with command line um, on Linux, this is very familiar, I think. It's just piping from one to the next. So you're taking the source, you're sending it to the filter, you're sending it to the destination. And you could do this on 50 files at the same time, which might overload your file system, but that's a different thing. Of course, don't forget to run the event loop. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen. Another very simple and very common example of um, using React PHP and using any kind of asynchronous system is to build a simple chat server. Um, this is a very typical example, and I'm, I'm going to show it because it, it really illustrates how easy it is to build some advanced stuff. So we create the event loop. We attach a socket to it. We create a storage object, an SPL object storage. Um, and we're going to keep a counter of how many clients are connected to our chat server. And then we can just say, OK, if we get a connection on this specific socket that's listening to a certain port, um, we're going to send a message. So if somebody connects to it, we're going to say, please enter your nickname. And that person is going to type in their nickname. And so we say, when we get data on that connection, we're going to do something with it. If we didn't receive a nickname yet, then obviously the first thing that that person types is their nickname, so we're going to store that. Otherwise, it's going to be a message that that person wants to send to anyone else connected to our chat server, which means we're going to loop over our different clients that are connected, and we're going to send out the message. Finally, we attach that connection at the bottom to our clients. Oops. We tell it to listen on a certain port, and we start the event loop. So this is an entire chat server in, what, 25 lines of code. So you can just run it on command line and then start connecting to it, and people can just chat away as much as they want. With a little bit of extension here, you can attach a WebSocket. You can make it a WebSocket system, and you can have actual chat client in JavaScript and people just go typing messages back and forth which is how many of the uh, 
live chat systems on many websites work. The other thing you could do um, is, for example, attach it to a zero MQ, a queuing system. Um, so in this case, of course, there is React zero MQ, even that exists. So what you would do is connect it to a zero MQ server here, and what we're doing in this case, if we add a periodic timer, we're just gonna send message every second, um, and we're gonna send it to the queue PHP Australia with a message and then, yeah, the counter itself. So this is the sending part of it, and then the listening part is actually also gonna attach, of course, to that zero MQ, is gonna subscribe to that same channel, is gonna listen to any messages coming in, and then it's gonna do something with it. So this is, very simplistic how you would connect, for example, uh, a WebSocket library to it, and you would have messages being automatically uh, sent out to um, listening basically on a, a certain queue here and sending it to the WebSocket to someone connected on your website. There's a lot of stuff that's based on React PHP. Um, there's, for example, Ratchet, which is the WebSocket library uh, used by a lot of, uh, a lot of websites. Uh, there is even a project called PHP AR Drone, which is based on React PHP and allows you to control, uh, well, one of those big AR drones, and you can actually fly it uh, fully asynchronously, communicate with it, tell it to go up and down and left and land and all those things, uh, which is kind of a nice project. There's a very cool uh, video of that on YouTube uh, as well. So the the possibilities of using asynchronous processing in PHP are, are immense. Um, having one process do serve basically a thousand clients at the same time, or doing a thousand different things at the same time is, is absolutely amazing. And it's something that wasn't possible 15 years ago, but with this being possible today, you can decrease the amount of time spent by your process when you have to do something um, multiple things at the same time, or you can just make it possible to connect to your PHP process from external uh, connectivity uh, at the same time by multiple clients. Now, I wanna finally put some uh, pretty important rules in a, in a warning as well, because this may sound like a lot of magic, but there are some restrictions, of course. Uh, golden rule number one is Asynchronous code doesn't mean it's faster code. You might be processing multiple things at the same time, but if the slowest part of your entire process is five seconds, then even making that asynchronously will still mean it runs five seconds. If you're doing an API call to an external system and that call takes three seconds, your code will at least take three seconds, even if you can do it simultaneously with other things. Um, golden rule number two is don't assume that your code will remain as fast. If you've been able to split up like the initial thing that I showed with the order and calling FedEx and sending out a mail, if you've been able to split that up and make it asynchronous, that's all great, but if at some point the API call to FedEx goes from three seconds to 20 seconds, then your entire process is gonna slow down. So in that case, it might be a better idea to put the slower parts into a queuing system and handle those offline. Which brings me actually to golden rule number three. If you don't need a response, don't wait for one. Basically meaning if you don't need to give a tracking number back from the Federal Express uh, call that you made immediately, then don't return it immediately. Don't, don't wait for that one. So just put it in a queuing system, uh, make the call offline, and then send the tracking number through email. Uh, because again, you don't have any guarantees on the speed of, the final speed of the thing. And as a final warning here, asynchronous processing like in React PHP doesn't guarantee execution order. If you're doing 10 DNS lookups, you might have added them one, uh, one host, then the next host, then the next host, but it might actually return the last one first. So there's absolutely no guarantee which one is going to be completed first or second or last which is kind of important in certain situations where you do want to guarantee that execution order. 
The only way to do that is by using the promises and having the then statement one after the other. So, plenty of rules and warnings, which brings me to questions. Um, in your experience, how reliable is React PHP when running as a long-running service on a server? So we, we, have, um, we have a React PHP running with uh, Ratchet, um, so as a WebSocket server. Um, and it's been extremely reliable up to the point where we've had at some point uh, over 100 clients connected uh, not non-stop, but at peak moments, and it's been running for weeks on end without any issues. The, the thing you have to be careful about, of course, if you have a lot of clients connected and you have some issues somewhere in your code that causes it to crash, they will all be disconnected. So you have to restart the process automatically, which can be tricky. There's a couple of ways of doing that, of course, um, but that's sort of the danger that you're not actually making requests to PHP. One client is not making a request to the web server and starting a new PHP process. It's actually one process serving multiple clients. So if that one crashes, yeah, that's a problem. Um, the only other issue we've had was uh, initially when there wasn't much load on it, that that process would connect to a database to keep a list of um, clients connected to it and retrieve information from that database for those clients, and that database connection would actually time out because it wasn't active anymore. So you, you also had to handle those kind of things. That's the problem you, you end up with long-running processes, which is not very common for PHP. Thanks. Um, do you need to install any other dependencies for WebSocket to be like ready for it? Like, Sorry? Do you need to install any other dependencies for it to be WebSocket ready? Um, for Ratchet, it, it's not an issue. Uh, it's built on top of, of React, mm -hmm. and it doesn't require you to add any additional stuff. Um, I don't know about the other WebSocket libraries, but it shouldn't, theoretically. On, on the client side, of course, you need some kind of JavaScript library that talks to it as well. Although you could write it directly in JavaScript as well. Do you have any advice for the case where you have um, used ZeroMQ to, to offline a, an operation that doesn't need to give any feedback to the user, but it, it does need to happen? So if there's a problem there, what do you do with the exception? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, there's, there's a couple of possibilities. What we usually do is we uh, have a, if you have a messaging system on, on your site, that's kind of easy. You just add a message to the user in the queue. Um, of course, if it's like an exception, then you might not want to give that exception to the user. You might want to handle it yourself because you don't want to show that to the user. Um, the best thing is to do is to set up a separate queue where you handle those, uh, those exceptions depending on what kind of exception it is. Uh, and either send them to the user or to your own internal mailing system or ticketing system, whatever, whatever you're using. Um, but you're absolutely right, you have to make sure that you handle those. And sometimes those can be, um, if you, for example, if you have a, an API call that needs to happen and you wanna don't do it online, you wanna queue it, mm -hmm. um, sometimes it could be a matter of retrying the API call, in which case you just put it back into the queue. Uh, sometimes it's a matter of yeah, actually triggering some kind of event and notifying you that there is an issue. Um, but yeah, you need to have error handling there, definitely. Thanks. Um, uh, does uh, React know how to limit itself? How to? how to limit itself? Huh. No, it doesn't. So <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, so what I mentioned before with 1,000 DNS lookups, 
there's no built-in functionality where you can say, okay, only, only allow this many at the same time. So theoretically, it could trigger, yeah, sort of a, a flood on your DNS server, or worse, if you do mail stuff with it, you could send out a thousand mails at the same time and flood your mail server. So that's, that's kind of a, a limitation, the, the lack of limitation. question. Okay. I will put the slides online. Feel free to provide some feedback uh, on join-in. That's always nice to hear what you liked and how speakers can improve. Thank you. <laughs>